Matthew lesson 62, New Testament video 67, Matthew 20 verse 20. Heavenly Father, thank you for your preserved word in English, the King James Bible. As we study it, we read and study it, may you give us insight here. May your Holy Spirit teach us as we come to your word once more with humble hearts. In Christ's name, amen. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Then came to him, the Lord Jesus, the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism? that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. We'll stop there. This sounds quite familiar, doesn't it? Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Back to Matthew 18. Verse 1. Remember when we were in Matthew 18? We have read Matthew 20 as well. Well, now we're in Matthew 20 and we're reading 18. Matthew 18, 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And then there's that discourse, that fourth discourse. He gives them here in Matthew's Gospel record, about being humble, not competitive and haughty, arrogant. Matthew 18, 4, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Your problem is arrogance, self-centeredness, childishness. Now, if we come back to Mark chapter 9, come back to Mark 9, Mark 9, And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? You see, they were arguing, traveling to Capernaum. But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. See, they knew it wasn't even worth telling him about. He asked them to lead them to confession here. What were you arguing about? Shh, they don't say anything. Why? They're embarrassed. Oh Lord, we were arguing about who was the greatest. See, they, 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 it wasn't even worth speaking about to him. They were ashamed, and rightfully so. Remember, 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 remember. Ministry, service to Jesus Christ, whether in Israel's program or, or, or ours, it's not about. Let's see who can learn more from the Bible. Let's see who can pray more. Let's see who can hold out more. 
Let's see who can pass out the most tracts or memorize more verses or read the Bible through many times a year. Let's see who can let's see who can do that the most. Let's see how many people I can get saved. I bet I can get more than you. I am going to be the focus. In the kingdom. It's me, 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 me. And I had cautioned you back in Matthew 18, my friend. If you think that the Christian life is a competition, you should have stayed lost because that's how lost people think. Selfish, childish, carnal, fleshly. If you're in the ministry, grace ministry, you don't even know anything about grace and you're legalistic in a denominational ministry, Whatever ministry you're in, my friend, if your labor is all about you looking for attention, trying to be better than others, you should have never gotten in the ministry. Philippians 2 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then that's Philippians 2. And it's about how Jesus Christ, he humbled himself. He didn't make himself the issue. He could have. He was rightfully God. But he made himself of no reputation. He humbled himself. He, came, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He became a servant. The way you go high in God's program is you go low. It's not self-aggrandizement. Exalting self and, and focus on self. Christian living. Christian ministry is not about self, it's about Christ. The very name Christian living, Christian ministry. It's Christ, Christ's life, Christ's ministry. Mark 9, 35. And he sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. The child is humble. Be last of all, and servant of all, if you want to be first. And he himself, Jesus Christ himself, is the epitome of what he just said. You'll see that in Matthew 20, shortly. Come over to Mark 10 now. Come over to Mark 10. Mark 10, verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him. Okay, so this is after Matthew 18, but this is the parallel of Matthew 20. Mark 10, 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, now, in Matthew, we read it was the mother of Zebedee's sons. Well, here are the sons of Zebedee, okay? James and John, the apostles. James and John and their mother all approach Jesus Christ. So, you, you combine Matthew and Mark, and it's James, John, and their mother. Now, see, Matthew presents their mother alone. Here we see James and John, they come unto him. The emphasis 
is on the mother speaking in Matthew. Now it's on James and John speaking in Mark. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand, and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. In thy glory. See, it's Christ's glory, and yet they want the glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. So the issue of pride has popped up a second time in the little flock. Matthew 18 it was the first time. Matthew 20 slash Mark 10, second time. And there'll be a third time. Come over to Luke. Come over to Luke. How, how, how sad. Jesus Christ's ministry, his earthly ministry, is winding down. And the little flock is being destroyed from the inside out. Satan is using their sinful flesh, the disciples' sinful flesh, James and John, and their mother. She meant well. She wanted the best for her sons, just like any mother would. But it was fleshly. Now look at Luke 22. How sad. This is the night of the, quote, Last Supper. Luke 22, 21. He's eating the Passover with them. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. He's right here. He's among us. He doesn't name him. But he says he's here. And they'll eventually learn who that, that traitor is. It's Judas Iscariot, the most trusted apostle. Their treasure. Luke 22, 22. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. It's God's plan. Judas made the choice, though. I'll be the one to do it. Uh, the, the Old Testament scripture said he would be betrayed, but it never named the man. Judas Iscariot said, I'll do it. Luke twenty two twenty two, And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing looking around like this. Huh. Is it you? 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 Now watch. 24. Here comes their sinful flesh. Luke 22, 24. And there was also a strife among them which of them should be accounted the greatest. Look at that context, my friend. Christ reveals to them, we have a traitor in our midst. One of you will betray me. 
that's going to be a low down individual. And then they all reply, it won't be me. I'll never do it. I'll be the greatest. I'll never do such a thing. And then the other one chimes in. Not me either. I won't do it. 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 I'll be the greatest. I'll never deny him. I'll never betray him. I can just hear them all clamoring, arguing. And watch what he tells them. Luke 22, 25. He never says, hey, and he identifies, you'll be the greatest. He doesn't. What he, what he says is, Luke 22, 25. He said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether is greater he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat. But I am among you as he that serveth. I am the servant. And yet I am the greatest among you all. All of you combined don't measure up to me. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. It's Jesus Christ's kingdom, not theirs. Hence sit on twelve thrones, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Uh, and then, of course, Simon, Simon, S Satan has desired to have you, and he will sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. Satan's going to attack the group. Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. Peter, you'll deny me. Somebody will betray me here. But somebody's going to deny me here too. And he says, Peter, it's you who's going to deny me. Not once, not twice, but thrice. And you know what? It's not in Luke. We'll read later. Peter argues. Uh-uh. Oh, no. No, he says, I'm not going to deny you. Yes, he will. Not once, not twice. Thrice. Three times. I come back to Mark 10. Keep your marker in Mark 10. Because the primary is Matthew 20. We're headed back to Matthew 20 for now. We'll come back to Mark 10. Matthew 20. Verse 21. Verse 20. They're trying to butter up Jesus Christ. They're worshiping Him. Oh Lord, we have a request. The mother of Zebedee's children, that's James and John, their mother. Matthew 4. Zebedee is James and John's father. We want a certain thing from you. What do you want? And she says, Grant these, my two sons, to sit on thy right hand and thy left hand in thy kingdom. Now see, at the close of Matthew 19, Jesus Christ has spoken of that kingdom. That regeneration. You'll sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, James and John, along with their mother, 
Hmm. They come to Jesus. Can James and John, can we have the best spots, the most honored positions? In, in the eastern kingdoms here, on the right and left hand of the king, those are the two most powerful positions under him. Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Those thrones there, the, 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 sitting on my right hand and my left hand, but those are special seats of authority. In the close of 23, Those are not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. The Father has made a determination who sits on my right hand and my left hand. I'm not going to make that decision. See, he, he's submitting to the Father's will. I don't have the permission. I choose not to have the permission. My Father will decide who sits on my right hand and my left hand. The Father has given me the kingdom in Luke 22, and I have delegated authority to my 12 apostles. I have not been given that authority to appoint somebody on my right hand and somebody on my left hand. No. Mm -mm. And, and Christ asks, Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. Yeah, they say, yes, we are. He says, indeed, you'll drink of my cup, and you'll be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. Now, as for sitting on my right hand and my left hand, though, that's another matter entirely. So will you drink of my cup? Yes, you will, guaranteed. Will you be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Yes, you will. Will you sit on my right hand, my left hand? It's not mine to see. Drinking of that cup. Now, what is that cup? In Revelation 14, for example, when Christ is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he wants the cup to pass. Now, in Revelation 14, the cup there is God's wrath poured out without mixture. Now the cup here, though, it's not the cup of God's wrath. It says James and John, they will drink of that cup too. So it's, it's not the wrath of God against unbelievers because James and John are not unbelievers. That cup here, that cup here, is his rejection and his death. See, the baptism that I am baptized with, the baptism that I'm baptized with, 22-23. The modern English versions, by the way, they eliminate that baptism with which I am baptized both times. So, Matthew 20, 22, and 23 are considerably shorter because they remove that reference to that baptism. And yet they retain it in Mark 10, the parallel passage. So they say, no, it's not inspired. doesn't belong. King James Bible is wrong. Matthew 20, 22, and 23 shouldn't have that baptism. But it should be in Mark 10. So it's uninspired in Matthew 20, but it's inspired in Mark 10. See, they butcher, butcher the Bible. Bible butchers. No, the dispensationalists aren't the Bible butchers. It's the Bible correctors, the textual critics. Those are the butchers. It says, the ten heard it. They were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Ten and two. That's reminiscent of the ten tribes of Israel, the northern ten tribes, huh? And the, the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. 
Israel and Judah, the split kingdom. Hmm. Just a little tidbit there. Ten and two. There's pitting against each other. The ten are against the two. You go read in 1 Kings 11. Huh? Yes. The divided kingdom. Because of Solomon's sin, idolatry, David's throne was lost. According to the law of Moses, God would politically weaken Israel. And he did. And they became Israel and Judah. Two nations, two kingdoms. The new covenant, though, he will reunite them. Jeremiah 31. Israel and Judah will be brought and brought together, made one again. The united kingdom again. Uh, Ezekiel 36 and 37, the new covenant and the valley of the dry bones and the two sticks made one and so on. Matthew 20. We'll hold that. Come over to Mark 10. You can come over to Mark 10 now. Mark 10, 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant us, grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. Matthew 20, verse 25 now. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Come over to Mark. Mark 10. Mark 10, 42 now. But Jesus called them to him, and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you, for whos but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus Christ wants them to think here. Think critically. You want to... Have positions of authority here. You want you're self-serving. You want to reign over others. That's how lost people think. That's how the Gentiles think. The Gentiles here, by the way, that's the, that's the people under Satan's control. Given over the evil world system and the Tower of Babel. Remember. God is dealing with the nation Israel in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Where are the Gentiles? Ephesians 2 says they're without Christ, without God.
the Gentiles here, they're not under God's control, but they want to be in control of others. Okay. Well, my disciples, here you are. You're supposed to be under my authority, my Father's control, and you're not interested in serving Him. You're interested in serving self. You're not interested in serving me. You're interested in serving your own fleshly appetites. The princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion. Dictators, a power grab. And how many people today in the area of leadership? I don't care if it's politics or local churches or seminaries. They love the authority, the power, inebriation, drunken with power. They don't care where they're taking others so long as they're leading. I don't care where I drive you as long as I do the driving. It might wind up in the ditch. So at least I was the one in control. Bullies, dictators, despots, authoritarians. That's these people here. The Lord says that attitude does not belong in God's program. They that are great exercise authority upon them, they seek to have dominion over them. It shall not be so among you. Matthew 20, verse 26. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Be the servant, not the leader. If you want to be, if you, if you want to be great, be the least. Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. And then guess what? Matthew 20, verse 28. He says, look at me. I am the example of that attitude of be least. I'm serving. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, I am rightfully God, and yet I have chosen not to be served as God. I am the God man. I have chosen to serve instead. I'm serving my Father. I'm serving sinners. I'm not serving self. Not my will, but thine be done. I've come to do thy will. Psalm 40, Hebrews 10. Dominion. Exercising dominion here. Let me point out to you, my friend, more about church leadership, ministry, Christian living, you can go back to Philippians 2. I, I, I think it's important we should read. We read this back in Matthew chapter 18. Read it again. Read it again. The same pride that Israel's little flock struggled with, Matthew 18 and Matthew 20, we saw in the book of Mark 10 there, and we saw in Luke 22, pride, 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 people like that all over today who are so drunk on focus on self. And we need to be extremely careful that we don't fall into that trap because Satan's evil world system will snag us like it snagged those poor saints in Christ's earthly ministry. Philippians 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves, looking on the things of others. Oh, well, there's the verse. I was, I was quoting the verse. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, 
but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Ultimately, Father God will get the glory. When Jesus Christ is praised, His Heavenly Father gets the glory. The issue of exercising dominion. We read exercise, the Gentiles exercise dominion over each other. Bullies, bullies, despots, dictators. You'll find many such fleshly people in ministry, in local churches. It's such a shame. And again, 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 we should be ever so mindful to guard ourselves. Don't repeat the mistakes of the disciples about being self-serving. 2 Corinthians 1. Moreover, verse 23, 2 Corinthians 1, 23, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. There are so many problems in Corinth, but Paul says, I haven't come yet to straighten them out. He's hoping that this epistle will give them instruction how to correct their problems. 2 Corinthians 1.24 Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. Paul said, I'm not going to be a dictator and come and say, come there physically. You will listen. Paul said, I'm not a dictator. I don't want to sit on the throne of your Christian life, Corinthians. I want you to stand by faith. Take the doctrine that the Holy Spirit is giving you through me. Believe it. And that's how you solve all your issues. Those are the solutions to your problems. I don't have dominion over your faith. I'm not your dictator. I'm not your boss. And yet, the, 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 the numerous preachers, the numerous deacons, seminary professors, theologians, they sit, the Bible teachers, they sit on the throne of their audiences. Christian life, if they are Christians anyway, I mean, I don't know. And they have to give an account to the pastor, or to the Sunday school teacher, or the deacon, or the seminary professor, or whoever. Am I doing right in the Christian life? And can I do this? Can I do that? And asking the preacher, or any other church leader, the priest, for permission. Can I do this? Can I do that? See, they can't stand by faith. They don't know the doctrine to believe anyway. It's the dictators in the local church, the Bible study or whatever, seminary, Bible college. The dictators are the ones bullying the Christians, bullying the church members. They're not following Paul's Holy Spirit Field instructions here. The Holy Spirit is leading Paul not to be a dictator over the Corinthians. He said, I don't have dominion over your faith. Jesus Christ is telling his apostles, don't be dictators over each other. See, that's God's design. If we refuse to follow that design, there will be trouble. 
Yep. How many local churches have been split apart, torn apart, because the pastor became a dictator? Instead of walking according to the Holy Spirit's leading, he walked according to the flesh. Come to 1 Peter. Peter writes, 1 Peter 5, local church leaders in the little flock. 1 Peter 5, 1, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Yeah, I'm partaking of the sufferings. I'm being persecuted. And Peter will lose his life for the gospel of the kingdom's sake. I'll also partake of the glory that will come out there at his second coming. The sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Peter, he identifies it as applicable to him too. 1 Peter 5, 2. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Don't be lords over God's heritage. Don't be bullies. Don't be dictators. That's local church leaders in the little flock. Second Corinthians 1. There's the body of Christ. Don't be dictators. We just read it in Mark 10. We just read it in Matthew 20. It shall not be so among you. If you want to be the greatest, be the least. Be the servant. Be the servant. Now listen. Oh, what a troubling verse. What a burdensome verse. Matthew 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That word ransom, that word ransom, that's the issue of a payment, like to free a slave or a servant. He's giving his life a ransom for many. A payment for many. He just said, I'm going to Jerusalem and die. Matthew 20, 18 and 19. He's going to give his life a ransom for many. Now, here come the Calvinists. Five-point Calvinists. For whom did Jesus Christ die? They would say, he died for the elect. He didn't die for everybody. He only died for those whom he had chosen to save. He's chosen them to believe. And according to the Calvinists, God gave them the gift of faith. He gave them the capacity to believe. And faith is the gift of God. It's, it's all a, a, a bunch of baloney. Just vain speculations of theologians again. It's not Bible at all. But, does the Bible not say in Matthew 20, 28, Jesus Christ gave his life a ransom for many? Didn't say all, huh? See, the Calvinist comes here, the five-point Calvinist, with his limited atonement doctrine, and says the atonement of Christ is limited only to those who believe, those God chose to believe. He, Jesus didn't die for all, only some. Now, it's certainly true here, Matthew 20, 28, Christ didn't give his life a ransom for all. It says he gave his life a ransom for many. So, stumble. People stumble over and that's why they fall into the trap of Calvinism. Because it didn't say all, oh, it said many. Who is the many? Who's the many here? 
rather than just pulling something out of thin air, making, making up an explanation out of it, fabricating an interpretation, the Holy Spirit assumed, Jesus Christ assumed, by the time of his earth and ministry here in Matthew, we will have already understood what verses went before, such as in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verse 8. By Matthew 20, verse 28, and by Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man has come to give his life a ransom for many. Write down Isaiah 53, verse 8. There's the cross reference. 53, 8. Isaiah 53, 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Was he stricken? The possessive pronoun here, my, for the transgression of my people, was he stricken? Hmm. Who's writing the book of Isaiah? Isaiah the prophet. So, for the sins of, for the transgression of Isaiah's people, was Jesus Christ stricken? Who is Isaiah's people? Is it the whole world? The Gentiles? It's the nation Israel. Israel. He shall save his people from their sins. Call his name Jesus. Matthew 1.21 I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember the Abrahamic Covenant? In our last study, we read the Abrahamic Covenant, Genesis 12. God will save Israel first, and then the salvation and blessing will go down to the rest of the world. He set aside Israel that he might bless the world through Israel. The Gentiles are down here at the bottom. The Abrahamic Covenant the order is Israel is saved first. Israel is saved first, and then it goes to the Gentiles. Salvation blessing goes to the Gentiles. Go to the Gentiles. So, when Jesus Christ is said here to give his life a ransom for many, the many would be what? The, the, the many would be who? Israel. I have... Come to give my life a ransom for Israel. It has nothing to do with people he's chosen to save. It has not, and it certainly has nothing to do with us today anyway in the dispensation of grace. Watch. Watch the dispensational change that occurred since Matthew 20 and Mark 10. See, if you don't handle the word of God rightly divided, dispensationally understood. You will teach a lie. You will teach Matthew 20, 28 and Mark 10, verse 45, as though they were true today. He came to give his life a ransom for many. That's true, but it's not true today. What is true today? Paul's ministry. Now watch what the Holy Spirit through Paul writes. The Apostle Paul. See, we can't, we cannot rely on old revelation from God in Matthew th through John and assume hmm, that's what he's still doing today. God has revealed further information. And that's Paul's ministry. See, if, you, if, if all you do is read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that's where the professing church stays 90 to 95 percent of their time they'll never get beyond to further revelation God showed the Apostle Paul 
and they stumble here because they don't understand this is where we are, not here. Watch what the Apostle Paul says. The Holy Spirit through Paul, the Lord Jesus Christ, ascended, glorified, Lord Jesus Christ, risen, ascended, glorified, Lord Jesus Christ, says this today concerning our dispensation of grace. 1 Timothy 2. Here's the contrast. He's come to give his life a ransom for many. 1 Timothy 2, 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now listen, 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 listen. 1 Timothy 2, 6. Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for many. No! 1 Timothy 2.6 Who gave himself a ransom for all. Here's the key. Here's the operative expression. To be testified in due time. There was a time when Almighty God chose. It's now time for me to reveal Christ didn't come to give his life a ransom for many. It's now time for me to tell the whole world Christ gave his life a ransom for all. 1 Timothy 2, verse 7. Never stop reading 1 Timothy 2 at verse 6. Read verse 7. 1 Timothy 2, 7. Whereunto, to the purpose of God making known to all the world, Christ gave his life a ransom for all to be testified in due time. When is Christ preached a ransom for all here? 1 Timothy 2, 7, whereunto I, Paul, and, um, or, and or, I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Now with the Apostle Paul's ministry, like in 2 Timothy 1 verse 11. Paul was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. All the Gentiles there. That's the all. He gave his life a ransom for all. Through the Apostle Paul's ministry and message, now we understand Jesus Christ didn't just give his life a ransom for many. He gave his life a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Paul is the due time testifier to say, no, Calvary is not limited to Israel now because Israel's fallen. You look, read the book of Acts, you'll see. She falls in chapter 7. She diminishes to Romans 9, 10, and 11. Israel's fallen. We can't be blessed of God through Israel. There is no nation Israel today. Through the fall of Israel, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Well, how does salvation come to us through Israel's fall? It's through the cross. Through the cross of Jesus Christ. And Paul is going to all people. No exception. He's going to all people and telling you can come to the God of Israel by faith in Jesus Christ. You don't, have to con you, you don't have to convert to Judaism. You have to keep the law of Moses. You have to be circumcised. You have to bless Israel. All you have to do is see that Jesus Christ is your payment for sin. That He paid your sin debt. Just like He paid Israel's sin debt. And that will be realized the new, when the new covenant is given. Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10. Israel's sins are paid for. Our sins are paid for. And we access that payment by faith. It's imputed to our account by we simply trusting the cross of Christ. Now, 
the order in the prophetic program was Israel's to be saved first, then the Gentiles. And that's still future. Israel will be saved, then they go to the Gentiles in, in the millennium. Today, salvation is in the church, the body of Christ, through Israel's fall. Okay. So, one more account in Matthew 20 to, to deal with, and then we'll be done. Matthew 20, verse 29. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. So I'll get my map one last time. And you can go ahead and turn to Mark 10. If you haven't kept a bookmark there, go to Mark 10. And we'll have that parallel to read shortly. So let's keep reading in Matthew 20, verse 30. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. Be quiet. Shh. But they cried the more, saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Okay, come to Mark 10. Mark 10. 46, and they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of com good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, arose and came to Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus answered, See how Mark is unique here? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. So the Lord Jesus Christ, it says here, Matthew and Mark, the Bible says, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's come to Jericho. Yes. So he crossed the, the Jordan River going westward. He's now in the vicinity of Jericho. So he's, he was in Perea. His Perean ministry, was, which was just a few months at most. He crossed the Jordan River. Now he's on the west side of the Jordan River. He's in Jericho, which is what just a few miles, a few kilometers west of the Jordan River and something what, like 15 miles or so, 24 kilometers or something like that, northeast of Jerusalem. So he's headed to Jerusalem, but for now he's in Jericho. As he goes out of Jericho, he heals now, this is where people complain. Bible contradictions, mistakes. Okay. If you come over to Matthew chapter 20 here, Matthew 20, verse 30, it says, uh, Matthew, if you come over to Matthew 20, verse 29, they're leaving Jericho, and there's a great multitude following him. And, he, and Matthew 20, verse 30, two blind men, 
or sitting by the wayside. He left Jericho and he heals two blind men. Now, Mark says this. As he goes out of Jericho, he heals one blind man. His name is Bartimaeus. Now, in Luke chapter 18, Luke 18, listen to this. Luke chapter 18, verse 35. It came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging, and he, and he heals him. What in the world is going on here? Matthew 20, Mark 10, Luke 18. Matthew says Jesus left Jericho and healed two blind men. Mark says Jesus left Jericho and healed one blind man, Bartimaeus. Luke says Jesus entered Jericho and healed one blind man. So, was it two blind men, Matthew, or was it one blind man, Mark and Luke? Was Jesus leaving Jericho, Matthew and Mark, or was he entering Jericho, Luke? Oh. You know, if people spend that much time critiquing the Bible, looking for errors, if only they spent that much time studying the gospel, maybe they'd get saved instead of nitpicking about that. Maybe they could analyze how Christ died for their sins and focus on that. And no, they'd rather, rather play around, waste time on contradictions. Not, not because they're trying to establish the truth, but merely they're trying to discredit the Bible so they don't have to be accountable to the truth found in the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Matthew 20 and Mark 10 are complementary. Jesus is leaving Jericho. That's what Matthew and Mark are focusing on. Luke is another account entirely. Luke is him going into Jericho, healing one blind man, going into Jericho. Matthew and Mark, he's going out of Jericho. Now, Matthew focuses on two men, blind men healed. Mark focuses on one. See, Mark is focusing on one of the two men that Matthew speaks of. The spokesman was Bartimaeus. His name is Bartimaeus. You only find that in Mark 10. Bartimaeus, the son of the unclean, the son of the defiled or the polluted sinner. That's what it is, okay? He's the son of the sinner. Unclean. Now, see, Matthew, Matthew 20 speaks of two blind men. Have mercy on us, have pity on us. O Lord, thou son of David. Look at that, that's Judah and Israel. The two blind men. Just like in chapter 9, Matthew 9, right after the Sermon on the Mount. I recall Matthew 9. Matthew 9, 27, the ninth miracle to follow the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus departed, Matthew 9, 27, when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, saying, cry, crying and saying, Thou Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. And then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it unto you. And their eyes were open, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man knoweth. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. Sermon on the Mount, in the kingdom. He speaks of what's, what, what will happen in the kingdom. Well, Israel and Judah are split right now. They're two kingdoms. They're two nations. Ezekiel 36 and 37 say they'll be one in the millennium. They'll be one nation again, back under David. They split because of Solomon's sin. Go read First Kings 11. 
They split after Solomon died. His idolatry cost them their political might. The Lord Jesus Christ, as the Son of David, He restores all authority back to David's throne. In the millennium, Israel and Judah are united. All twelve tribes. The ten northern, the two southern. Israel and Judah united. They have David as their king. The curse of the law is reversed. And now they're one nation, one kingdom again. All under David, all under Jesus Christ. Son of David. He's the king of Israel. Yes. He's the rightful heir. The multitude, they, they, Tell the blind men, be quiet. The blind men here aren't quiet. They cry out all the more. Lord, thou son of David. Lord, thou son of David. Shh, be quiet. Lord, thou son of David. Lord, thou son of David. This is in the area of Jericho. The curse of sin. You will remember Jericho, it's west of the Jordan River. Jericho was where Israel came into the promised land under Joshua. Come back to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter, let's see, is it three? Joshua three, yeah. Joshua three, 16. That the waters, they're crossing the Jordan River. God has dammed the Jordan River. 3.16, Joshua 3.16. That the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon and heap very far from the city Adam, that is beside Zeratan. And those that came down toward the Sea of the Plain, even the Salt Sea, there's the Dead Sea, failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho, across from Jericho. And Jericho, of course, that's the first city Israel conquers in the land. Remember the marching around the wall of Jericho and Jericho falls. Jericho's wall falls. Israel conquers Jericho with the power of Almighty God. Now, Listen to Joshua 6, 26. And Joshua adjured them, he commanded them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn. And in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. Jericho is cursed. Cursed. You build that city again, you're cursed. Your son's cursed. Eh, guess what? King Ahab and Queen Jezebel are now reigning. And this is like 500 years later. 1 Kings 15, 29. In the 30 and 8th year of Asa king of Judah began Ahab the son of Omri to reign over Israel. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel and Samaria. See? Israel and Judah are split now. This is in the north, northern area. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel and Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, pagan woman, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, an idolater, and went and served Baal, false god, idol, and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. In the time of this great apostasy, 1 Kings 16, 34. In his days did Hiel, the Bethlehemite, 
built Jericho, he laid the foundation thereof, and Abiram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof, and his youngest son, Sagub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. Huh. So that cursed city is built in light of paganism in Israel. Okay. Now come over to 2 Kings. 2 Kings. 2 Kings, chapter 2, 18. So Elisha, not Elijah, the prophet Elisha, Elijah was just taken up into heaven. Elisha is performing this miracle at Jericho. 2 Kings 2, 18, he tarried at Jericho. Verse 19. 2 Kings 2.19 And the men of the city, that's Jericho, said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruise, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters, and cast the salt in there, and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. And so the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he, had, which he spake. Jericho was cursed, and the Lord healed Jericho's waters there that were poisonous, in other words, bitter. Jericho's waters were cured. That's the curse of sin being lifted in the millennium. And in Matthew 20, now, what, 800 years later, 800 plus years after Elisha, now we see Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry, and he's in that same vicinity, where Israel came in, and there was a curse, and then Ahab and Jezebel arose with their Baal worship, and in the context of pagan religion taking over Israel, somebody rebuilt Jericho, and then there's a curse there with the water. Well, now that water is healed. Elisha, the prophet, heals the water. Well, now in, in Matthew 20 here, Jesus Christ, he heals some men. He heals two men. Well, let me say this. He healed one man as he went into Jericho, and he healed two men as he goes out. So he's healing the nation Israel as a whole, and he's also healing Israel and Judah, the split kingdom. And he's restoring their sight, their spiritual blindness, the pagan, pagan religion has blinded them. He restores their sight, and now they can function as his kingdom, one kingdom of priests. Not two, not two nations, not two kingdoms. They're now united as one. See, Israel's believing remnant is crying out, have mercy, have compassion, have pity. See, they're crying out in faith. See, and despite any opposition, they're, they're determined to come to Christ. They keep crying out. They're, they're forbidden to speak. Don't say anything. Don't call his name. Oh, they call him anyway. Son of David, son of David. See his royalty? See, he's the rightful heir to David's throne. He can heal Israel politically, spiritually, and so on. He can heal them. He can restore them financially, too. They're, they're poverty stricken and everything else. He can restore them completely. He had compassion on them. When he hears, he stands still. He they have his attention. What do you want? What do you want me to do? Lord, open our eyes. The hand of the Creator God touches those physical eyes that are blind. And now they see. Israel, she's spiritually blind. She's politically blind. Restored, immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. And there's the millennium pictured again. Healing, not only physical healing, spiritual healing. 
political restoration, physical restoration, political restoration, spiritual restoration, and there's Israel ready to go into the millennium. And you know, now, Jesus Christ, the King, He's ready to enter Jerusalem. The triumphal entry, so-called, is now here. He has less than a week, and then He'll lay down His life and die. That'll be the culmination of Israel's unbelief their rejection of him. All this time we've been harping on it. He's been rejected. And now it's time for him to lose his life. And he's ready. He's ready. Okay, and we'll stop there. That's Matthew chapter 20. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your faithfulness. It's, it, it'll never be Israel's faithfulness. It'll never be our faithfulness. We can forget it. Thank you for the grace that you offer us, what we don't deserve. Thank you for your mercy holding back what we do deserve. And just as you are faithful to us, you will be faithful to Israel. And just as you're faithful to Israel, you'll be faithful to us. They haven't been permanently set aside, only temporarily. You're doing something with us today, the members of the church, the body of Christ, with the gospel of the grace of God. How Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. And that he's the head of the body. The body of believers who will simply come to him by faith in his finished cross work as sufficient payment for their sins. And just like you will take us into the heavenly places to rule and reign with your Son for His glory, for your glory, you will take the nation Israel into your earthly kingdom and they will rule and reign with your Son for your glory and His glory as well. Thank you for that privilege. And may we continue to study your word, rightly divided, walking by faith in an intelligent understanding of your word and will to us. Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, the dispensation of grace. May we never confuse ourselves with the nation Israel with prophecy. We're mystery, we're not prophecy. Thank you, in Christ's name, amen. And that is Matthew 20.